Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's special webinar for August 18th, 2020. This was the last in our three-part series on presidential elections and campaigns, What Can We Learn From History? The focus of this program was the election of 1980 between Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. We were joined tonight by Dr. Jeff Sikinga, Professor of Political Science at Ashland University and Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and Dr. Chris Burkett, also Professor of Political Science at Ashland University. Thanks for listening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center. So glad that you could be with us this evening for the third and last uh, in our webinar series on historic presidential elections. Um, this is sponsored by the Ashbrook Center with our partner, uh, and a special thanks to our partner, Missouri Humanities, for co-hosting this event with us. Uh, they've been wonderful partners, and we're so delighted that they could be uh, joining us and helping get the word out about uh, this program. So thank you very much to Missouri Humanities and to all of you for joining us this evening. As many of you know, the Ashbrook Center is an independent educational center located at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. Our, our mission is to strengthen constitutional self-government by educating our fellow Americans in the history and principles of our country and in the habits of reflection and deliberation that are necessary for self-government. And we really think that this program is part of that mission. Uh, we think that you can learn from history. We think that you can study history, you can ask it questions, and you can listen for its responses. That history can give us some perspective on the issues, even the issues we face today. So we thought in this election year in 2020, why not look back at some historic and really defining presidential elections? In our first webinar, as many of you know who joined us, was on Thomas Jefferson and the election of 1800. We took a look back at that bitter contest between Jefferson and John Adams, um, what it meant for America at the time, and what lessons we could learn from that for our own um, times today. Uh, 1860, last week, Abraham Lincoln and that election, what it showed us about the character of Americans, what it showed us about the particular statesmanship of Abraham Lincoln, and what it meant for the country. And today we move to the third of those webinars and that, of course, is Ronald Reagan and the election of 1980. Uh, we move into the 20th century, but many of the questions, many of the themes continue throughout, as we see, and as I'm sure we'll know from talking tonight. And, and that talk is going to be in the form of a conversation, because as always, at Ashbrook, we really believe that education is not about information. It's certainly not about indoctrination, but it's about thinking. It's about discovering the truth. You know, we really believe, as I've said before, in Aristotle's old maxim that all people by nature desire to know. And then we add, but they don't want to be told. And they want to discover it for themselves. And the way that we found you dis discover these truths best for yourselves is, is having a conversation. Having a conversation with the past, having a conversation with each other, and thinking about these questions together. So, so delighted that you'll be joining us. Please, uh, with your questions, as we have been so far in the, in the series, send us your questions. I'll try to get to as many of those as I can. I apologize ahead of time if we can't get to all of them. There are always so many and so many good ones. But please do submit those because we have a rare opportunity tonight to, to bring the past alive. Maybe the recent past for some of us, maybe the ancient past for some of us. Um, but the, the election of 1980, and I'm joined for that conversation tonight with um, Dr. Christopher Burkett. Uh, Dr. Burkett is a professor uh, of uh, political science at Ashland University, and my colleague now for many years. Um, well, it's been many years, right, Chris? Yes, yes. <laughs> I think we've many, reached the point of many. Yeah. <laughs> many good years. Um, Chris, Chris got his um, bachelor's degree from Ashland University, in fact, um, where I think he was a double major in history and interestingly in art, uh, and is himself a really fine artist and often gives talks to our students on art and, uh, and art and politics and art and democracy and the art 
that we see and the themes of democracy that we see not only in American art, but also in architecture like the White House, uh, the Capitol building and many others. Really fascinating stuff. Chris is a trained uh, historian, but also a trained artist and brings those two together in really interesting ways. But when he after that, he went on and got his uh, after working out in the real world for a number of years. <laughs> and, and earning a living, uh, he decided for whatever weird reason to go back to graduate school and uh, get his <laughs> master's and doctorate uh, from the Institute for Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas, where he completed his PhD. Uh, Chris's dissertation and much of his scholarly work has actually centered on foreign policy in the American founding. And in particular, the really interesting question, what kind of foreign policy do the principles of the Declaration of Independence commit America to? And that was a robust debate about that at the time of our founding. And it's a debate, frankly, that has continued uh, up until this day. And we see it even in the documents for tonight in the prominent place that foreign policy played in the debate between uh, Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter in the, during that presidential election. Uh, Chris has been with us, as I said, for a number of years. He is the, co he is the director of the Ashbrook Scholar Program, which is our honors program for students of history, uh, government, and political economy here at the Ashbrook Center. Uh, he has been a part of our teacher programs from the very beginning. He teaches in our Masters of Arts in American History and Government program, a wonderful course on the Constitution and Constitutional Convention. He teaches in our Teaching American History programs. He's really taught just about everything on the American founding, American foreign policy, the presidency. And um, he is also, uh, he and I share another thing in common, which is we are the students of uh, a, a great mentor and great man himself, Peter Schramm, uh, who passed away almost five years ago to the day, but was an executive director of the Ashbrook Center, a great influence uh, on Chris as a student, and then later on me as a young faculty member. Uh, we learned at Peter's feet the importance of taking America seriously, taking American history seriously, and taking American politics and political thought seriously. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining me this evening oh, for this kind of conversation. Um, it's a pleasure. pleasure. You know, you and I were talking about this, and, and it, you, you said something that kind of grabbed me uh, when we were talking about this earlier today. And, and forgive me for saying this, but we've known each other a long time, so I feel like I can. You said that the presidential election of 1980 actually started in 1964, which is a s strange claim, to be honest with you. Yeah. What do you yeah. mean by that? It's a little strange. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks, thanks very much for having me. Um, so, so, you know, the election of 1980 has sometimes been referred to as the Reagan Revolution. Uh, and I think Reagan, Reagan liked that way of thinking about it. But um, if it was a revolution, it wasn't a revolution in the sense that we often think of revolutions where they're sort of at least modern revolutions where they're quick and bloody and over with, right? Uh, sometimes revolutions take long time, a long time to, to sort of grow and build and develop uh, and then finally come to fruition. And 1964, which is a pivotal uh, year for, for Reagan and for uh, the development of, of conservatism and the Republican Party, in many ways, set the stage for the election of 1980. Uh, I don't want to go, go too far with this, but in many ways, the, the election of 1980 was uh, essentially over many of the same issues that the election of 1964 was over. And Reagan, Reagan was just getting into politics at that time in 1964. As you'll recall, Barry Goldwater is the Republican candidate uh, running against uh, Johnson, the incumbent. And um, uh, at that time, um, conservatism as a as a political movement was just coming into its own. It was very young. Um, the The Republican Party itself uh, was um, kind of a hodgepodge of various political groups that didn't necessarily, you know, what they had in common fundamentally was they didn't like uh, great society liberalism, right? <laughs> so you have libertarians. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so-called neoconservatives who had been, you know, former liberals mugged by reality um, and, and, and a lot of different groups, um, but they hadn't quite coalesced to the point. So in many ways, the election of 1964 uh, was important because it, it put certain ideas out there 
that could form the basis of a of a real kind of conservatism as a as a as a real viable political alternative to to liberalism. And Ronald Reagan played a very large role in articulating what conservatism could be and what it could actually mean uh, at a time when, and again, a lot of these various people that were very disaffected with with great society liberalism were looking for an alternative, but they were searching for something that they would have in common. So by the way, you know, of course, Barry Goldwater is running in 1964 and he loses, right? Spoiler alert, in case nobody knew that. Uh, but, uh, you know, Barry Goldwater didn't lose the election in 64 because he was the wrong candidate. Uh, he was a very good candidate. He was a very solid conservative candidate. Um, but the main reason he lost was because conservatism at that time was uh, an idea that was sort of ahead of its time. It was still gelling. It hadn't become quite as popular or widespread a movement at the time. And so um, uh, Reagan, again, playing the pivotal role that he did, was very important in his support of Goldwater. Uh, in that he, in supporting Goldwater, he articulated um, certain fundamental things that became really the heart of conservatism that could could unite these various groups of people uh, together in the Republican Party. So, you know, for example, libertarians, they liked Goldwater because of his um, anti-big government rhetoric, right? But they didn't necessarily like the rest of what Goldwater was doing. Uh, Neoconservatives liked his hard stance on against communism and foreign policy, but uh, but not necessarily everything else. What, what Reagan contributed to the conversation was the idea that conservatism stands for certain things. And that conversation began, uh, Reagan began that conversation in 1964 and continued that all the way through his political career as governor of California from 67 to 75, I believe. And then even after he was governor of California, uh, I'm not sure if people know this, Reagan had a, um, a daily radio commentary, uh, sort of like for those of us who remember Paul Harvey, right? When Paul Harvey would come on every day at 1230 or something, and he would say, you know, something quick, and then I'll be back with the rest of the story. Well, Reagan did that for four years. Um, and he would he would begin every day by saying something like, do you know what your government's up to? This is Ronald Reagan. I'll be right back. They do a commercial and come back. And he would every day for four years give a very nicely written, clear, articulate um, uh, account of some problem in government or some some principled idea that he wanted to put forward. And the cum cumulative effect of this is, I think, and uh, again, I might be overstating this, but, but Reagan had the effect of really shaping what you might call the conservative mind uh, over the course of those nearly 20 years, culminating in, of course, the election of 1980. Right. But it's but it's not smooth sailing simply, right, for Reagan, because well, he, he backs Goldwater, and you gave us a document to look at um, his famous speech, A Time for Choosing, which, right. which, in which he says, um, in, a, in an era where uh, the great society is just coming into being, it looks like uh, liberalism in its modern form in the Democratic Party is ascendant. The Democrats control Congress. They control the presidency. Um, the idea of conservative uh, attacks on this seems to a lot of people like Herbert Hoover or even farther back. Like we're really past that stage. So Goldwater runs, he's very articulate. Reagan in that speech of time for choosing is very articulate in, in outlining the principles of conservatism, but Goldwater gets trounced. Yes. Now, now Reagan, of course, as you say, goes on in the next couple of years to become governor of California, but it's not clear to me at least that Reagan's conservatism or Goldwater's conservatism immediately takes over the Republican party. So, no. so what happens from when Reagan is governor and then on 60s into the 70s, what, what's the Republican Party like? What's Reagan's relationship with the Republican Party? Because, of course, he eventually he becomes the nominee of that party. That probably would have been surprising to a lot of people in 1964. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I personally think that Reagan from the 1960s on is one of the one of the people who really has a clear vision of what. Uh, conservatism is and should stand for, but with regard to the party, he's he's a uh, I wouldn't say he's an outcast, but he's you know he's an important figure. His his prominence is growing within the party, especially as governor. But he's a uh, I think from the position of, of, of party leadership in the seventies, he's a uh, he's a uh, you know uh, <laughs> I was tempted to make the the comparison to a B actor, <laughs> right? Sort of, <laughs> which would be a terrible uh, attempt at humor. So. Uh, 
but he's, you know, he's a sort of B-level figure, but his prominence grows. And part of the reason Reagan's importance grows is that the, the problems that he identifies, the concerns that he identifies in 1964 become more and more true. His predictions about what we're going to become in 64 start to become reality. And all of a sudden, Reagan is recognized, uh, well, uh, all of a sudden, over the course of time in the 70s, by the late 70s especially, Reagan is recognized as sort of that voice in the wilderness that had been warning us that if we go down this path, this is what's going to happen. And and so Reagan, I don't want to misrepresent Reagan as just the sort of you know person who's pointing out all the problems. Reagan had also been uh, articulating a positive understanding of what conservatism stands for. Right? It's not uh, it's not uh, it's not simply you know conservatism is against this and we want to cut this and we want to cut this. Although there was a lot Reagan wanted to cut, but the cumulative effect of of Reagan's uh, insights into you know the path that we seem to have chosen in 1964 came came pretty much to fruition uh, as you know the economy became worse, uh, foreign policy issues became you know became worse and and were raised to the level of, of crises, uh, especially with Iran um, uh, and you know Russia, the Soviets invading Afghanistan and these sorts of things. People really started to noticed that Reagan had been the guy who predicted that if, if we make the wrong decision in 1964, this is likely where we're to end up. We're likely to end up. And you add on top of that, the, you know, Reagan's concerns that government would continue to sprawl and grow and we just continue to increase spending. We would dig ourselves into holes, uh, into a hole that we could not easily dig ourselves out of. So, so he's an he's a important figure in the Republican Party in because he's the Republican governor of California from sure. the late 60s through 70s. Um, but he runs, and and to some extent, and Carter actually points this out in one of the, in the debate transcript you had us read, that as a governor of California, he talked very conservatively. He didn't always exactly govern in the most conservative way. Um, but of course, he had to deal with the legislature in California, and that always requires compromise, and governance always does. But... Um, He's obviously prominent enough by the time we get to 1976 that he mounts a challenge to the incumbent Republican president, Gerald Ford. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about why does Reagan choose to to uh, campaign against Ford and, and what effect does that have? Well, this is a great question, uh, and, and it has a lot to do with Reagan's understanding of federalism. So Reagan is governor, by the way, and and uh, you know when Carter pointed out that Reagan governed uh, as a kind of progressive on the state level as governor, he's he's not wrong, but that was not an unusual position to take. I mean, in, in that he was, say for example, imitating Reagan's great, you know, uh, um, uh, the person he admired very much, Calvin Coolidge, who was governor of Massachusetts, had governed very progressively in a certain sense, but then as president. Uh, uh, tended to be much more conservative, if you will, right? So Reagan thought that on the state level, um, there's a lot of, that government can do, right? Uh, a lot more things that government can do, but that's on the state level. The, the state should be doing things that states ought to be responsible for. Um, what Reagan was really opposed to was the federal government uh, trying to do those things that, that states, including governors and state legislatures, ought to be looking out for as their first concerns, right? Uh, he was opposed to that, first of all, on constitutional grounds, and secondly, as, uh, because he saw the, the waste and inefficiency that often happened when, set, when, when programs <laughs> became federal in nature, right? So, uh, you know, Carter points out that, that Reagan, you know, did this and did this as governor of the state, and Reagan's response, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, is, you know, yeah, I was governor of a state. I wasn't, I wasn't you know, <laughs> I wasn't president of the United States, right? Or I wasn't Congress. Now, that's related to his opposition to Ford, who he saw as essentially ha having fallen into that, that mindset of, uh, of liberalism, which assumed, in, as Re in Reagan's understanding, that the federal government does things better, simply, right? So he identified Ford as essentially a, uh, yes, a Republican, but but one who had bought into the idea of big federal government, uh, wasn't willing to take a strong stand uh, uh, in terms of, of, you know, setting a limit to the sorts of things that the federal government was willing to do. Um, and, and by the way, that's the same sort of problem that Reagan was, was dealing with back in 1964 as well, when you think about uh, the, the kinds of people that came together initially uh, as Republicans in 1964. The real issue in 1964, by the way, 
I mean, Reagan has his, you know, frames the issue very nicely, right? In his mind, the issue is we have a choice to make between going down the road of, of, of greater uh, ever sprawling government, right? Increased government spending and government entitlement programs and government bureaucracies uh, and, and in which, you know, a, how does he put it? A, a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital plans our lives for us, you know, better than we can. Uh, or we can return to uh, an understanding of of the relationship of government and individuals that is much more firmly rooted in the ideas and principles of the American founding. Um, the, 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 the outcome of the election in 1964 really, though, was between, at least among liberals, was a question of uh, do, we, do we go down the road of, of sort of great society liberalism or do we remain sort of New Deal liberals, if you will, right? And great society liberalism won. And uh, from that point forward, it was a, it was a, uh, you know, the trajectory was, was, was greater and greater government programs. Ford, in Reagan's mind, was, uh, was sort of a soft liberal of sorts uh, on the federal level. And so he did not have any problems opposing him on, a, a, you know, on, on a matter of constitutional principle. So he opposes him, and of course, Ford's vice president, I think, is Rockefeller. So um, that that's the the Rockefeller wing of the Republican Party. So Ford is sort of in the center. Ro Rockefeller's a little on the on the liberal side of the Republican Party. Then you've got Reagan, who's clearly by this time established as a na as a national conservative figure. Sure. And um, I think I think I heard somewhere that. When Reagan uh, Reagan gave up and got a spe got got up and gave a speech to the 1976 Republican convention, and was followed by Ford. But Reagan gave up got up and gave this speech, and after he sat down, a lot of people turned to each other and said, "We just nominated the wrong guy." Well, that's right, exactly right. Yeah, why did we not nominate this guy? So, I, I mean, look, and part of the reason for that was, uh, you know, look. Reagan was very articulate, as we know. He was known as the great communicator. He had a knack for saying things uh, in the right way that could just get get across to people, right, in a sort of common sense way, uh, with with very few words. Sometimes, right, he was like Lincoln in that. He he just knew exactly the right way to say things. Um, and 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 uh, he he was known for that. You know, there's a reason they gave they asked him to give this speech in 1964, right, in support of Barry Goldwater. Um. But it, it again, it took some time, right? Some of the things that Reagan were, were, was uh, was calling for were um, were um, I don't want to say radically new. That's not quite the term. But look, old habits are hard to break, so to speak, right? And Republicans had essentially, and I'm oversimplifying this a little bit. Uh, a, a, a Repu the, most Republicans since the 1940s had essentially been moderate liberals uh, in a certain sense. Um, and uh, and so what Reagan is really trying to do is is reform, re 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 renew. In fact, uh, uh, start what he uh, laid the foundations for what he calls a new beginning, a new start, uh, not just for America but but for the Republican Party. And that, that's going to take some time. So so, so um, some folks uh, are are one of our our audience is interested to know how did Reagan um, develop his ability to 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 write and speak so well because you know one of the things we've noticed the election of 1800 and jefferson of course lincoln in 1860 and now reagan is one thing these defining elections have in common the candidates is um jefferson may not have been a great public speaker but he was a great public writer right in fact john adams says that's why he was picked even as a young man to write the declaration of independence because he had written other things that people love so much uh, there's no higher example of political poetry or just pure poetry in America than Abraham Lincoln's speeches, the Gettysburg Address, for example, right? right? Beautiful. How did Reagan develop his ability to to take complicated ideas, as you said, boil them down into common sense phrases, but then make that common sense phrase um, sound right and kind of sing? How yeah. did he do that? Because he was not a man of, of a very deep education, at least in no. his college career. No, he was not. He was, you know, um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are some parallels with Lincoln here. I mean, uh, Reagan did come from a relatively poor background, uh, uh, low income family in northern Illinois. So he was a man of the people before he became famous, you know, as a, as a Hollywood actor. Um, 
And, and, you know, those sorts of people just have a kind of common sense way. I come from those people, as you know. <laughs> we have a kind of common sense way of putting things. Uh, and uh, so, I, I, you know, having grown up, in, you know, in the environment that he did, he, he would have been used to that way of thinking. Um, his, uh, his, his education was not that great. He himself said that, right? In fact, one of the, you know, he commented that uh, one of the perks of being elected president is that you have your your uh, your your uh, school transcripts uh, classified uh, designated classified information. So, <laughs> but but Reagan read uh, here. This is again interesting parallels with some of the other great statesmen in, in U.S. history, Lincoln, even Washington. Right? Reagan read. Um, he wasn't a deep reader. I can't say necessarily that he was reading treatises on politics and things like that. But he was familiar with the great speeches of Lincoln. We know that because in his speeches, which Reagan, by the way, had a big hand in writing. He had speechwriters, but Reagan would often draft his own speeches and then, you know, give them to his speechwriters to edit, and then Reagan would re-edit the edits. And but, you know, there are great references to Lincoln. There are great references to the founding fathers, uh, uh, many important documents. So we know that he read, and um, uh, and it became um, that coupled with his perhaps his acting career had some role in this as well. But 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 he just was the sort of person who could speak plainly, plain common sense ideas uh, is a real gift and not everybody can do that, right? So, I mean, he just has this um, this knack of putting certain ideas in front of him, uh, in front of people. Uh, I was looking for a particular example here. Um, I mean, this is poetic almost, as you say, right? Uh, in his speech to uh, accepting the presidential nomination at the Republican convention in 1980, uh, he says, we are going to put an end the notion that the American taxpayer exists to fund the federal government. The federal government exists to serve the American people. I mean, that's that's a perfectly <laughs> nice, pithy statement, right, that just gets its way immediately into your mind. Yeah, the federal government exists. It's not the opposite, right? So you just had this knack. Um, in, in the 1980 presidential debate, uh, he had so many great, great, uh, great uh, lines and moments, right? Not only was he funny, but he just had, again, this knack of putting things out there for, for people to, to let sink in. Uh, at one point, uh, Carter was going on, at the, President Carter, at the, at the debate in 1980 in Cleveland, uh, was, was, uh, was going on about, um, uh, you, know, you know, all the reasons that we're in the problem, dealing with the problems we're dealing with, right? OPEC, Iran, this and this, and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, Reagan's response to this was, look, we don't have uh, an inflation problem. Uh, we don't have inflation because the people are living too well, he says. We have inflation because the government government is living too well. I mean, just nice, clear you know, statements like that just burn their way into people's minds and memories. Um, so he just had a real knack for this. Um, so he, so he, he, as you say, uh, had learned how to deliver a line, obviously, as an actor. But, but that's interesting to me that he had done this kind of reading. And I think that people don't always know, as you were talking about the 1960s, that he, he was, I think, a spokesman for General Electric and went around and sort of honed his pitch in, and honed his ability to listen as he went around to various plants for General Electric and just talk to employees. Really interesting company program to, to have Reagan go around and sort of listen to employees and sort of talk to them about America and American ideas and principles. But I think he, he said himself in his autobiography that he th those are places where he learned what words and phrases and sentences resonated with people? Yes. Or regular, ordinary people who worked at the GE plants. Yeah. And that, that really helped him. It wasn't foreign to him because you say he, he was never an affected guy. He was a common sense, ordinary Midwestern character. But, but he, he learned and heard the words. Yeah. Uh, and that's and you can see that, as you say, not only his speeches, but in the debates, because he has that he has great one liners. He has those and the great turns of phrases and jokes. Um, it, it doesn't get him. But but look, and, and as Gerald Ford said of himself in his wonderful self-deprecating way. Well, you know, what what do you what did the people expect? I'm a Ford, not a Lincoln. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. It's a great yeah. line. <laughs> but That's so right. Ford is uh, Ford is Ford, <laughs> an honorable man who served well, um, <laughs> but lost to Carter in 76. Right. 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 And a lot of Republicans after that loss thought maybe Reagan was the guy. 
Yes. Maybe his ideas are a little too radical for us, his conservative ideas for the mainstream of the Republican Party at the time, which sort of is right there with Gerald Ford. But um, maybe he's the guy. Maybe he's the right one. Uh, what does Reagan do to lay the groundwork for his run in 1980? Because clearly after the 1976 campaign and Ford's loss, Reagan probably is the presumptive front runner for the Republicans in 1980. But what does Reagan do between 76 and 80 to prepare for that campaign? Well, I, I, again, I mentioned the, the radio uh, right spots that he did every day. So he kept himself, uh, you know, sort of in the public eye with, with reminders of his his uh, 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 his views on these sorts of things. You know, by, by the way, you can read those radio addresses in a collection called Reagan in His Own Hand because he wrote every word of these, uh, these you know, 15 minute or so uh, radio spots. So. Um, so he continued to remain in sort of a, a national figure or have a kind of national presence in presence in articulating uh, what he considered to be fundamental American ideas. Um, so uh, uh, Reagan, I know, worked sort of behind the scenes. He was uh, he was talking with with important figures in the Republican Party. He happened to be uh, personal friends, as you know, with. Uh, with John Ashbrook, uh, you know, the, the, whose honor the, the, the center we work for is named. Um, so he was, I know that he was very involved with other members of the Republican Party who were also conservatives. Um, and so uh, I don't know that it was immediately, immediately clear, by the way, going into 1980 that Reagan was the front runner. There were some others on the ticket. Bob Dole was a very well known name. Uh, you know, I think the top three. Uh, were, were Reagan, Dahl, and, and Anderson. Anderson, of course, ended up running as, a, as an independent. But it became pretty clear early on, I believe, in the, in, the, in the primaries in 1980 that Reagan was, in fact, the right person, not only because he was um, a, a very personable person, a guy who genuinely, genuinely loved people, and, and that came across clearly, uh, but, but, uh, but because he could articulate the ideas that had come to, uh, you know, sort of really uh, start to take root uh, in the Republican Party. And, and also, he seemed the right uh, person for the job in terms of dealing with foreign policy issues. Um, uh, here's a man of character who, was, uh, who understood and had said repeatedly uh, that the only way we can deal with the Soviets is from, from a position of strength and not for weakness. Uh, and so Re Reagan uh, you know, repeatedly demonstrated what his character would be like uh, as president in the in the few years leading up to the election of 1980. Yeah, and that's interesting. It's not one of the speeches you had us uh, uh, read, of course, but he gives a speech to the National Association of Evangelicals, I think, in 1983, where he he famously calls the Soviet Union an evil empire. Oh, yes. Which which, yeah. of course, uh, sent off shockwaves to people. Um, but and I, I recall talking with someone a uh, historian of that time who said, and his speechwriters, he wrote that in himself, his speechwriters kept taking it out. Yeah. And he kept putting it back in yeah. over their objections because he said, that's the moral clarity that, that, that we need to uh, articulate to the world. And because he just thought it sounded right. Yeah, yeah. As a yeah, phrase. Reagan, Reagan was consistent in his condemnation of communism as evil. Uh, that was not the first time he had called it that, by the way. But it was the first time as pr a president had, had, had you know, had, had used that term to describe uh, communism. Co communism was fundamentally bad, uh, evil, according to Reagan, because it it did it, it was built on the fundamental assumption that human beings were actually incapable of being free. And as a result, the state thought of 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 individuals not as individuals, but really as as tools for, to be used for the purposes of the state, right? And I, I think that's that um, uh, real hatred, if you will, of communism partly informed his concern over the course he saw great society liberalism taking the country. It wasn't communism as a, as a sort of economic system, but but uh, the differences between uh, great deal, uh, sorry, great society liberalism or socialism, if you will, and communism were differences of degree. Uh, that is. Uh, you know, the great society liberalism put us on the on the course to greater and greater reliance on government programs, government assistance. And of course, Reagan understood that with every every program that comes out of the federal government, there's always a catch, right? And the catch is a loss of greater 
freedom, uh, uh, the, the, the erosion of individual freedom, the, uh, the erosion of individual opportunity uh, to pursue happiness as they choose. And, and with that, by the way, uh, came the erosion of, uh, of progress in Reagan's mind, right? Uh, the more socialist or more communist, uh, the, the more you rely on government for, for more and more things uh, that you become, uh, the, the less progress you're likely to make, because as Reagan says repeatedly, including in some of the documents for this evening, right, it's, it's free enterprise. It's the freedom of the individual to go out and, and pursue happiness, to work for, you know, whatever success is for them in life that leads to innovation. It leads to new and better ways of doing things, right? So, so the problem with, with uh, any form of sort of government regimentation is that it, it erodes the very possibility of progress, real progress. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in Reagan's mind. As he says at the end of the, his remarks at the, um, the debate in 1980 with, with President Carter, uh, he says, I'm uh, quoting him here, I would like to have a crusade. I'd like to lead that crusade with your help. And it would be one to take government off the backs of the great people of this country and turn you loose once again to do those things that I know you can do so well because you did them and made this country great. So it's, it's individuals, right? exercising their individual liberties and freedoms that have made this country great, not just for the individuals, but for the country itself, right? So, uh, so, so these are, but these are, those are, as you say, by the time we get to 1980, um, the Republican Party has sort of shifted toward those uh, ideas and Reagan becomes the nominee, but a number of people have been asking uh, questions from our audience, really good ones. The, the role of ideas is clearly important, but there's also the role of of Reagan, the person, in winning the nomination and then going up against Jimmy Carter. And you had us read some speeches from Jimmy Carter, his, his opponent there, President Carter. Right. Um, talk about a little bit about, you know, what do we see in those speeches of Reagan and maybe in contrast to, with Carter about Reagan, the person that enabled him to be politically successful? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. Well, look, Reagan was... Uh, Reagan was uh, funny. He was witty. He was quick. He seemed clear in his own mind about what he believed in, and that allowed him, I think, to be very articulate in the kinds of answers he would give to questions or the kinds of ideas he would he would he would put out in response to you know to criticisms. Uh, he had a kind of affability about him that was genuine. He, uh, people felt as though he really did like people, and he did. Apparently, he just liked people, right? Uh, he, he wasn't a, a disdainful, but he was an optimist. Uh, Reagan liked to think of himself as an optimist. And I can tell you, by the way, part of the reason I'm, I'm really happy you asked, you asked me to talk about this topic is um, this was actually, 1980 was the first election I remember paying attention to as a kid. And I remember, you know, at least hearing my parents and others in the family talking about these things. And, and what Reagan brought to the table that Carter didn't seem to be able to bring was a sense of real optimism and hope that Yes, things are bad, but but if we restore in our minds a, a belief in the fundamental ideas that have made America great, we can not only get out of this, we can move on to greater and greater uh, things, right? We can move on to greater prosperity, greater security, greater happiness, greater opportunity for all. So that he was an optimist, and I think that really came across in the way he spoke. So President Carter, I, I think, made a, a, a huge political blunder uh, in, in giving this speech, uh, which has come to be known as the Malaise speech, even though Carter doesn't use the term Malaise, right? He calls it a crisis of confidence. Uh, Carter, in fact, titled the speech, uh, speech, I think it was called the speech on national energy policy. Uh, it was very quickly dubbed as the Malaise speech. There's a reason people call it the Malaise speech, even though he doesn't use the word Malaise. It's depressing, right? Um, so what, interestingly enough, Carter, um, one of his pollsters uh, suggested to Carter that, that uh, part of the, pro the problem among voters was that they were suffering this crisis of confidence after a series of, of setbacks, American setbacks, Vietnam, you know, sat political assassinations, RFK, JFK, um, uh, uh, MLK, others, uh, Watergate. And so, uh, and so Carter, you know, gave this speech, with, which had a, a, a very negative effect on his appearance in the eyes of the American people. Because the, 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 the message that people got from it was, things are really, really bad, and they're going to get worse. 
and we just have to suck it up. And somehow, if we stick together, we can we can muddle through this. I mean, that's the. I mean, I'm really oversimplifying the message, right? And uh, and it, and it did nothing to help Carter's image, right? As as a guy who's just suffering as president, right? Feeling the pain of others, but he's suffering through the presidency, sort of uh, not quite knowing what to do to to make things better. Uh, Reagan in his uh, in his uh, accepted speech uh, of the Republican nomination responds to that directly. Uh, he says, "Look, we face a, dis a disintegrating economy, a weakened defense, and an energy policy based on the sharing of scarcity." They tell us, and this is almost a direct response to what what Carter had said in that speech. They tell us that they have done the most that the most that humanely could be done, humanly could be done. Sorry, they say that the United States has had its day in the sun that our nation has passed its zenith. They expect you to tell your children that the American people no longer will have to cope with their problems, that the future will be one of sacrifice and few opportunities. My fellow citizens, I utterly, utterly reject that view, right? And he goes on, he says, you know, the American people, the most generous people on earth who created the highest standard of living are not going to accept the notion that we can only make a better world for others by moving backwards ourselves. I mean, so, you can immediately hear the difference in tone, right? And, and Reagan had this, again, not just a knack to communicate clearly, but to inject this real feeling. And here was a guy, if anybody, who could, who could help us think through the problems that we're facing and find real alternatives uh, and solutions to those problems. So some folks are wanting to know, and it's a really good question. Um, and, and it's a big question, but let me ask it to you. Maybe it's unfair. Um, why does Reagan win in 1980? You know, <laughs> how, how, how much of it is, is it the right man at the right moment against the right opponent? Yeah, it's or, both. Or what is it? No, I think it's, it's both. Look, I mean, Car Carter was, uh, Carter was a, um, you know, trying not to be too hard on him. Uh, C Carter was the wrong man for the office to deal with the kinds of problem, real problems that he had to deal with. Uh, I'm, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt because it, 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 he's a Democrat. He invokes Franklin Roosevelt, but his disposition in office and the way he talks about crisis and the, and that crisis of confidence speech is so contrary to someone like Franklin Roosevelt and how he talked about when the crisis was even deeper. Yeah, uh, yeah, Roosevelt. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself, right? I mean, let's just suck it up and bully our way out of this, right? The Great Depression or World War II, whatever it was. Car Carter could not get conveyed to the American people generally speaking, a sense that he uh, either had the the uh, ideas to get us out of the problem or even the character to get us out of the problem. He was viewed as weak, right? There was a lot of criticism, by the way, from both left and right uh, over his handling of foreign policy, uh, his sort of ostrich head in the sand approach to you know letting the Soviets get away from things. Uh, his policy of detente was considered to be a, 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 a by many, if not most, a massive failure because uh, for the sake of relaxing or normalizing uh, relations with the Soviet Union, they were getting away with bloody murder in the 70s. Uh, and Reagan, on the other hand, was was seeing what was going on and was saying, you know, look, we, again, you cannot trust the Soviets to behave themselves if if all you do is show them how weak you are, right? So it's a combination of Carter, I think, not being the right man for the job at the time, given the crises that he was dealing with. But on the other hand, Reagan Reagan had um, all the right qualities in, in in that election in 1980 to show, and he did it. This is the thing: you can't just have the qualities; you've got to be able to show the American people that you have those qualities, right? To deal with these things in a very hard but tough way, right? Because they have to be dealt with. We cannot continue to bury our heads in the sand and hope that the Iranians release the American hostages or that the Soviets somehow say, "Oops, our mistake," and they withdraw from Afghanistan, right? Or all these other sorts of things. So it's a great question, but I think it's a combination of both. Uh, you know, look, uh, Carter. Carter. Um, well, I'm trying not to be too ungenerous to, to Carter here. Uh, he he was uh, Carter would have made a good technocrat of sorts. I mean, he was. You know, look. I mean, give Carter the the, the you know if if things could be done just by establishing policy and then following through on the policy, great. You know, could be. A, Perfectly good at that, but 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 Carter didn't seem to have anything new. Uh, uh, 
you know, new ideas, new ways of thinking, new ways of talking about what we can do to really fix things in America. Reagan brought that. Reagan really did bring that to the table. And I think that was the, the tipping point for him. So how much of a role, you mentioned already the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1980, which seems like a setback for Carter's foreign policy. Um, the, obviously, the Iran hostages. I think a lot of us who were around then, uh, even me as a, as a young teenager, um, remembers that, uh, was obviously a, a disaster in, politically for, for Carter. How, how, much of, how much of a role did foreign policy play and in particular, because it, it takes up a lot of space in the debate transcript that you had us look at, a lot of it, uh, particularly the Cold War and what's the right approach to the Soviet Union. And, and Carter says something really interesting to me. He says that Reagan's understanding of the Soviet Union and his approach to the Soviet Union is a departure from his predecessors, both Democrat and Republican. Right. So could you talk about how Reagan understood uh, in the election of eight, uh, 1980, how he understood the Soviet Union, Soviet communism, and what approach he articulated to it. And how is that different from how other people were talking about it? Yeah, so again, it, it, yeah, foreign policy, national security, Cold War stuff, is, it is one of the three big things that, that, that Reagan really hammers uh, on in this election, right? So out of control spending, sprawling government, and uh, mismanagement of the Cold War. Those are the big three things that he really focuses on. Um, in Reagan's mind, uh, Carter, Ford, and Nixon had all mismanaged Cold War uh, foreign policy strategy, uh, in part because they had adopted this policy of detente, right? I don't want to get too technical here, but we all know that detente was meant to, you know, bring about some sort of relaxation of things, but really what it was meant to do was normalize relations between the United States in the Soviet Union. Uh, by the time um, Carter took office, Reagan described detente as essentially appeasement, right? Uh, you know, we'll give you anything you want. We'll basically bend over backwards for you as long as you don't, you know, misbehave, Soviet Union. Uh, that was the way Reagan liked to characterize Carter's uh, use of detente, and also Ford's and Nixon's, by the way. Uh, Reagan believed that detente was was moving us backwards. It was going to unravel or unroll any of the, the progress perhaps that we had made in showing the Soviets that we were serious about not only containing the expansion of communism, but possibly even rolling it back, right? And that seems to me to be really important, right? Because you have three approaches to the Soviet Union that you outlined there. Detente, like let's get rid of the tension as much as possible. And then you have the sort of Harry Truman approach, which is let's recognize that there's a fundamental tension between the Soviet, Soviet communism and America, but our goal is to contain it, keep it where it is. But then you have some people like Reagan who say containment's not enough. We have to, our goal has to be roll back the progress of communism. Yeah, that's is a that big the way in which he sort of is more aggressive and sort of breaks with the foreign policy uh, establishment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Reagan really does uh, break from the sort of, you know, 30 plus years of containment thinking, right? Even as it was established by uh, uh, by Kennan, George Kennan, way back in 40, 47, 48, right? This idea of containing was the ultimate goal. Um, and the ultimate goal of containment had always been to, if we can contain it long enough, sooner or later, the Soviet Union will come around and sort of see that they have more to gain by uh, from cooperating with the West and the United States than by constantly trying to agitate and and you know cause trouble and expand and so on and so forth and eventually we'll reach the point at which we have normalized relations but the problem with that uh, uh view of containment was it assumed an end in which the soviet union was a permanent facet of the international landscape and reagan rejected that reagan saw the benefits of containment as it had been employed in certain ways especially under truman um in the previous 30 some years of the cold war but, but Reagan thought that, that you know, uh, there's absolutely no reason we have to accept the fact that the Soviet Union is here to stay. Why do we assume that that's true? Um, Isn't that an incredibly radical idea it, and thing to is. say out loud? And, and a lot of people found that to be dangerous. Hence, you saw, you know, uh, Reagan described as a warmonger. He's the guy that's going to get us all killed. Uh, there were, you know, I remember a music video uh, by a band I actually like, you know, uh, showing Reagan as a, or puppet cartoon character sort of thing who 
was having nightmares and would roll over and hit the red button, the nuclear button in the middle of the night and get us all killed. So yeah, he was he was the guy who was going to lead in, lead us into a, an actual shooting war with the Soviet Union, uh, a nuclear war, right, in the minds of a lot of people because the language he used. First of all, by calling the Soviet Union evil, right, <laughs> an evil empire, but also by saying, no, we can actually eliminate the Soviet Union if we play our cards right. A lot of people thought that was too radical of a departure. It was going to upset this balance that had sort of been established through detente, and it was just going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make the Soviet Union more aggressive. Um, so, so Reagan so saw things that people, others didn't see, by the way. And what Reagan did was he put what he what he did was he he matched he said let's match the economy of the free world and especially the free economy the, the right of the United States against the communist economy of the Soviet Union and let's see which wins let's see which one can can produce you know not not you know the the kinds of goods and services that not only the people need but what it takes to 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 last out this cold war and become a permanent fixture of the of the of the international landscape so, so uh, I've got a really interesting question here from another great one from from our audience, and that is, um, and it, it's a question that says, asking, what would you say comparing FDR taking over from Hoover is similar to Reagan taking over from Carter? Um, and, and in other words, it's revolution, and, and it even makes me think about what Barack Obama had to say about Reagan. You know, you would think Barack Obama, who is a progressive Democrat, wouldn't have very nice things to say about Ronald Reagan. But in Obama's speeches and even in his book, he actually says, no, give Reagan credit. He realigned the country politically. And yeah. he's, he's, he, he and FDR are the two presidents of the 20th century who really did that. And of course, Obama wants to go back to FDR and roll back the Reagan revolution, but right. but he gives Reagan credit for that. So would you say, in fact, that Reagan's, uh, uh, you know, is Reagan's election in 1980 um, the, the result of a revolution that's been happening, or is it the cause of a further revolution, or or is that the right way to, to think about it? Is, it? is it a big event like FDR taking over from Hoover? Oh, yeah, certainly it is. I, I think it is a, a, a revolution of sorts. Again, a revolution meaning, you know, a turning from one thing to another. It had the effect of, of I don't know if I want to say transforming, but maybe reminding Americans of who they are, who they were, what their fundamental principles were, right? What the, the fundamental American ideas that had informed, you know, what Thomas Jefferson called the American mind for centuries that allowed uh, uh, you know, this country to be truly great in terms of the opportunities it provided for, for, for individuals. So in, in terms of the effect of influencing how, how people think and, and reminding Americans of what America traditionally had, had stood for and aimed at, it was a big transformation that took place. I, again, it took place slowly in, in some ways over the course of, you know, 1964 to 1980, but by 1980, when Reagan really gets the national spotlight, he puts those ideas, those fundamental principles, the fundamental ideas, his fundamental vision of what America is, he puts that front and center in his speeches and now has a national platform to do so. And that's another important thing to keep in mind with Reagan. One of his other, I think, great contributions is he revives in, in American political discourse the importance of thinking about the American founding and our fundamental ideas, the ideas of the Declaration of Independence. Really, for the first time since Calvin Coolidge, uh, Reagan is is the is the first president to 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 really put the the ideas of the American founding front and center in his in his political speeches. Other presidents had done that. Even Jimmy Carter, you know, here and there says, "Let's you know not remember, let's not forget the founding and blah blah blah." But it's all sort of vague and squishy. Reagan really emphasizes that, and ha and that has the effect, I think, of 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 getting Americans to remember who they are and where they've come from and what they really stand for, as Reagan understood those things as well. Is, is that why Reagan was so fond, as you said, of Lincoln and of Jefferson? Because it seems like what we've seen from the other two webinars in those elections, both Jefferson and Lincoln also believed that, um, that there's a kind of natural small r Republican majority. That, right. that their elections were really restoring, that had sort of gotten yeah. out of whack or gotten lost, 
that was really rooted in the, Amer the, in the hearts and minds of the American people and their attachment to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, which they might have forgotten or misunderstood for a while, but they saw it as their job to kind of restore Americans' understanding of those. Is that one of the reasons you think why Reagan was so attracted to Jefferson and Lincoln? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think he, he makes reference to that idea in, in his Time for Choosing speech in 1964. Um, after he talks about the, the, the problem of sprawling government and the increase in numbers uh, in terms of uh, federal bureaucracy and so on and so forth, he says, look, somewhere, uh, somewhere, Reagan says, a perversion has taken place. He uses the word perversion, right, which means things have been switched in, in terms of order or something, right? Uh, our, a perversion has taken place somewhere. Our natural inalienable rights are now considered to be a dispensation of government. And freedom has never been so fragile, he says, so close to slipping from our grasp as it is at this moment. So what Reagan wants to do is correct that perversion or, you know, maybe that inversion of, of, of how we think about things, right? Rights don't come from government. Rights are natural. They're inalienable. They're inherent in human beings. Um, and you know, that's a very fundamental belief that Reagan held, and he wanted to remind Americans of what Reagan considered to be that fundamental truth. So I do see some great parallels, as you're pointing out, with, with what Lincoln saw himself doing, uh, for example. So, and then um, Reagan's, you, you've mentioned it already a little bit, but a number of folks have asked, you know, again, more about Reagan's character. On the campaign trail, um, he's funny. <laughs> he's in a, way that, in a way that perhaps Jimmy Carter uh, is not so funny. Yeah. Right. No, that's the other great thing. I mean, J Jimmy Carter was, uh, you know, you know, he before Bill Clinton said, I feel your pain. Jimmy Carter said, I feel your pain. So, you know, Carter came across as a guy who could commiserate with you. But, you know, but again, I'm, I'm beating up on Carter a little bit here. You know, I feel like if you were to go to a bar and have a beer with Carter, all you do is complain, you know, or, you know, talk about each other's troubles the whole time. But Reagan was funny. He was lively. He was witty. Um, you know, even at the at the the, the debate, the, the televised debate, um, you know, Reagan was was constantly making the audience laugh. Um, uh, at one point, uh, Barbara Walters had asked Jimmy Carter, President Carter, the, 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 she asked him a question about, oh, I think it had to do with energy policy, and Carter sort of gave a, a an answer, and then uh, Walters rephrased the question and asked him again, and Carter said some more things, and and Reagan interjected and said, Barbara, you've asked him the same question twice. I think you deserve at least one answer. May I please? You know, just little things like that. And the audience would erupt with laughter, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Reagan was, he was witty. He was funny. There's so many great stories about Reagan. Uh, I remember the story of, uh, you know, when he was governor in, in California, he was dealing with the student protests at Berkeley, which got very ugly and and violent and um and reagan actually went to um as well I, I think he was coming out of the capitol and the student there were a number of student protesters uh you know waving signs and things like this a lot and uh, reagan got into his car uh he was being driven of course as governor and a number of students mobbed the car and were shoving signs and hitting the windows with these signs that said we are the future we are the future and so reagan very quickly grabbed a piece of paper and wrote something and held it up on the window and it said, God help us all. You know, <laughs> just he's just quick like that. So um, one of the best lines Reagan had during the um, uh, during the election was uh, um, uh, was um, what, how did he put it? I'm trying to remember the exact wording. Uh, uh, a, re a, re a recession is when you was when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job. And recovery is when Jimmy Carter loses his job. <laughs> right? so, these great lines. Uh, and again, this is connected to Reagan's ability to, to not only say things that are funny and witty and humorous, but also in a sort of down-to-earth way that gets the point across. He would occasionally tell the story about this little community he said he knew of, the little town that decided they wanted to, uh, they had passed a law, and they wanted to raise their street signs from five feet to seven feet for safety purposes and visibility rights. So the street signs, they wanted to raise two feet. And somebody from the government shows, the federal government shows up and says, uh, we have a program to do that already. Only under our program, we just lower the streets two feet. So, you know, I mean, again, 
because Reagan had this knack of, of pointing the absurdity of some of these government programs out in a way that was both common sense and, and extremely funny. So, well. <laughs> Chris, that's that's wonderful. Uh, thank you. There's so so many interesting aspects to this election. Thank you so much for just spending some time with us, having conversation. Um, boy, as I always say, the time has gone quickly, and it certainly has. Um, thank you so much for joining us and having conversation with me, Chris. And and I want to thank everybody else, uh, you all out there, for joining us. Especially thanks to the teachers who are joining us through our Teaching American History program. Um, you know, Chris mentioned that a time for, for choosing Reagan's speech, it's one of many speeches that I just want to highlight in this book here, 50 Core American Documents. It's actually um, done by Professor Burkett. It's a wonderful resource for, for you, for your children, for your grandchildren, and for your students. Uh, you can, it's available from the Ashbrook Center, ashbrook.org. You can find that there. It's filled with lots of primary source documents from, from the founding period all the way well into the 20th century wonderfully edited and excerpted by Professor Burkett. It's just must reading for, for students and teachers and citizens. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, lo we look forward to being with you again. I want to thank again Missouri Humanities for their partnership with us in this event. You know, Missouri Humanities offers a number of programs, um, and I just encourage you to really check those out. Free virtual opportunities, to learn about Native American, German, and Civil War heritage throughout the upcoming year. Um, so please visit MissouriHumanities.org to connect to the people, places, and events that shape society. And again, I want to thank them for their generous partnership. Learn more about the Ashbrook Center, please. We'd love to have you do that at Ashbrook.org for resources, TeachingAmericanHistory.org, TAH.org. Uh, uh, if you want to listen to this again, or you'd like to send this, as with the other webinars, we'll be uh, sending you a link to a recording of today's webinar. So you can go and listen to this again if you missed something, or send it on to your friends, your family, your children, your grandchildren. We love it to have it shared as far and wide as possible. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. I hope we've got an insight into these really important elections and sort of the idea that, that they show us that these pivotal, pivotal elections really go back to reminding the American people of fundamental principles and renewing our own understanding of those principles. As un undoubtedly we'll have that political debate this year in 2020, I hope this series has given you some insight and some historical perspective on that debate. Thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our free webinars and resources for teachers of American history, government, and civics at teachingamericanhistory.org or simply tah.org.